I, I begin every presentation basically by saying um, there's a there's a phrase from a Monty Python skit uh, where somebody says I'm a completely self-taught idiot. <laughs> um, and what that means is that everything I've learned, I've learned by doing it completely wrong and going, oh, you know, OK, that may be that's probably true of the first 10 years of doing this. I've been doing this over 30 years now. And um, so it's uh, it, it basically anything I've done, uh, I try to save you from going through the pain that I went through to get it done. And I guess that maybe that's everybody's teaching method, but uh, that's certainly true of, of mine. Um, so there's uh, just in uh, discussions uh, before the meeting, you know, now I, I, I found out that uh, the, the group is maybe more genealogically inclined than your standard library program. So I may talk a little fast to get through the very basic stuff here uh, so I can get to family search, which you're you're probably all familiar yeah. with mm -hmm. and uh, at least show you what you're up against to find certain things uh, when it comes to uh, Italian records. But I can certainly speak from experience, um, the accuracy or lack thereof and, and uh, a lot of things. So um, anyway, well, let's get past the starter page here. Okay. So simple model, this may apply to other ethnicities too, but it's um, it's what I ultimately had to do over, it, it took me from starting in the early to mid nineties and I went to Italy in 2003. Um, so, you know, I know a lot of people, actually uh, somebody met me on, email i don't know there wasn't social media really at the time and they basically said we're going to italy uh in a month and uh we want to do our family research can you help us hmm. um yeah i can help you by saying don't go to italy in a month <laughs> you're not ready you know and uh anyway that's it's a long long story but they were going because their daughter was in college in paris or something so the timing of the trip had nothing to do with genealogy. At any rate, um, it's the last thing you want to worry about is writing to Italy or going to Italy until you've done a lot of earlier homework. Okay, where is your ancestor from? Now, that's the obvious question, but it, when it comes to Italian records, they're kept and cataloged for the most part by the small town. And a lot of people say, well, I know where my family's from. They're from Palermo. They're from Naples. They're from Calabria. Well, that may all be true, but uh, we're going to talk about that, that that's not enough if they're not from those cities. If they're from those cities, you're going to have a hard road ahead of you because those there's a lot of records. But um, they're typically going to be from a smaller town that nobody remembers, and that's the thing you need to find out about. So where are they from? What town are they from? And what records are available for that area? We're gonna go over each of these points one by one in a moment. Learn how to read the records. This is where many people who are not genealogists say, you know what, I think I'm gonna take up Needlepoint or I'm gonna watch Netflix series all day and not do this. But again, if I can learn it, you can learn it. I do not speak Italian. I cannot understand anyone speaking Italian to me uh, unless they put a pause between the words uh, when they talk at full throttle. I don't get it, but I can read a record blindfolded. Okay, so that's the you'll you'll need to learn how to read a record blindfolded. And part of the handout is to give you guys a clue as to what the records are likely to look like that you're going to read. So this is the key that a lot of people. If they're going to get started with their Italian research, they say, well, uh, like, you know, they, they want to jump to Italy right away. And, and I, I know people who have flown all the way to Italy and gone to the civil records office and asked them for copies of things that were available in their living room. Um, and that's depressing to me, but OK, it made them happy and they saw 
statues and ate food and everything. That's great. You want to go to Italy as a tourist when you're not ready to do research yet? Fine and dandy. It's a wonderful, wonderful place. Um, but anyway, again, I'm going to go through all these points that you want to do everything you can possibly do in the United States with Italian records. And these are going to be, for the most part, uh, civil records. There are not that many Catholic church records, and Italy is predominantly Catholic, not exclusively, but predominantly. Um, and um, so again, we'll we'll discuss that in, 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 and then after you've done all that. So I spent almost 10 years to take every ancestral line back to about 1809. And um, so the... Um, uh, once I got that far and I couldn't go any further back, so I'd have a marriage in 1812. So they were born in the 1780s, 1790s. Okay, so that's it. That's as far as I got. So, um, uh, so okay, that's the end. I can't do any more. Maybe I can find a death record for one of their parents and it'll jump me back another generation. That's all great. But then you you hit the wall. When you hit the wall on every line, now it's time to think about going to Italy because the church record's there. You have to actually go to the church in the town uh, or maybe a, a, a diocesan uh, archive. That's when you can uh, continue your research in, uh, in Italy. You, you really don't want to go. You don't want to start there. Believe me, it's complicated. The church records are in Latin. They're handwritten as paragraphs. And if you can't worm your way through that, um, I'll tell you a quick story. I tell a lot of quick stories and then they add up to be long stories. Um, uh, I, I had, I, when I got back from my trip to Italy and I had pictures I had taken of some of the records, uh, there were records that did not look like they were baptisms of children. They were just long paragraphs. And so, and a lot of it was abbreviated. They abbreviated the Latin. Okay. Now I didn't go to Catholic school, so I didn't learn any Latin. I I could work my way around it, but I'm reading these paragraphs and I couldn't figure out what is this and why am I supposed to care about it? So I live in far north suburbs. I live in Lake County. And I said, well, who would know Latin up here? Uh, the schools don't carry it anymore. I said, I know the seminary. So I literally called St. Mary of the Lake Seminary and I said, who is your resident Latin genius expert? And they said, uh, darn it now, of course, I can't remember his name. Um, but anyway, they, I mean, they gave me his name. And so I, I wrote a letter to him and I said, can you make head or tail out of this? And it took about three weeks later, he had responded saying, I got your letter and I'll get to it. And three weeks later, he wrote me back and he said, I can't do much with this. I said, okay, I don't feel so bad if the, the guy had taught at St. Mary of the Lake for literally 60 years probably 50 at that time. And he couldn't figure it out. So I didn't feel so bad. Mm -hmm. um, there will be things that will be exceptions. We want the low hanging fruit, as my boss would say. So where is your ancestor from? Well, okay. If you really know definitively what little town your Italian ancestor is from, you can skip this step. Um, I'm giving a talk at the uh, Italian Cultural Center. Now it's known as Casa Italia in two weeks. And they're going to laugh at this page because they're either from there, or their parents are from there, and they're set. They really, they've been there, you know. But for people like me who are third generation, uh, we had to work on this the hard way, okay? And of course, uh, my, my, I call him my sainted grandfather. He left after six kids with my grandmother. He determined that they weren't compatible, and he left. So I, didn't, I never met him. So I never got to talk to him about his voyage and being in Italy and any of that stuff. So I talked with his kid sister who just passed away in November at almost 101 years old. And she was born in Chicago, but she says, oh yeah, family's from Bari. Oh, okay. And it turned out, all right, they're from Bari, but they're from a little town near Bari. So you need another source mm -hmm. rather than you know, the, the family lore. That's coming up in a second here. So the less reliable sources, um, I've seen a lot of death certificates 
mostly Cook County, but elsewhere. And the vast majority of them, the birthplace, if they were born in Italy, it says Italy. That's not going to help you. Just being so you, you they, these are sources you can use if you run out of everything else, but they're not really good choices. Uh, the census, uh, I'm finally digging into the 1950, and guess what? It's just as useless as 40 <laughs> and 30 and 20 and 10 in terms of finding a town where people are from in Italy. You got Illinois and Italy and wherever else your families are from, and that's that's about it. It's it's extremely rare when you find a census page where somebody actually cared enough to write down the detail uh, city where someone is, is from. It, it, it wasn't important about that. And then family, family oral history, it depends on who it is. Um, but if you know somebody, if you have a relative who was born over there and they say, we were from Bari, press them. What town near Bari? Were you from the city of Bari or from a little town near Bari? And that's where it'll, you know, then they'll, and then they'll pronounce it in a way that you'll never spell it right. Um, my family's from a town called Trigiano, T-R-I-G-G-I-A-N-O. And by the way, if anybody in this group has any links to Trigiano, Bari, Italy, please send me an email as soon as possible. I've got your family tree done <laughs> to infinity, okay? Um, now, um, I had, um, and, and, and then I had to do my dad's side, my Polish side, and I, I, I let everyone die before I asked them for this information. So again, that's the... It, some people don't get that choice. They take up genealogy when they're 70. And of course their parents are gone and, you know, uh, but I was young and I didn't care about this. And then my grandmother died. And then the last of the ones born in Italy died. And um, so the, 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 I did hear from, you know, one person said, oh yeah, we're not from Bari. We're from another town near Bari. It's called Trijan. And I've actually seen documents that are, have it spelled T-R-E-E -E space J-O-H-N, Trujan, because we Southern Italians, some of us like to chop that vowel off at the end when talking that way. And unfortunately, it doesn't help us spell the town correctly. But my Polish grandmother, she said they were, we that side was from Krakow. We are so far from Krakow. I would have bought her a map and an atlas and a globe just to say, okay, really, where are we at? So you really need to double and triple check family when they're telling you this stuff, unless you were there and you were born there and all that. So what are the good sources? The best source, and now there's still stuff spelled wrong here too, are the naturalization papers. Now I know, I know how far you guys are from me and I know how far south you are of Chicago, but I'm hoping you've got relatives who came through Chicago um, first, if you didn't, you know, I, again, that can't control that part of it. Uh, but the naturalization papers for Cook County, now the naturalization was um, federal, but you have county courts that have some and you have the uh, U.S. District Court that has some national archives, um, still at 73rd and Pulaski, I presume. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I, I grew up in Burbank. I was, mm -hmm. I started my research living at the National Archives on the one night a week it was open and, uh, going through sound decks of the 1920 census. It was crazy. Uh, but anyway, the naturalization papers, they don't typically just accept Palermo, Calabria. They want the name of the town, but then the clerk who's typing it or writing it down spells it wrong. So you end up, that's where I got a tree John from. So you run, you run into that kind of stuff, but at least you get a starting point of what could be called tree John that's in Bari. And then you look and you find it in a list of uh, towns. Passenger lists are good too, but if you have a common name, you might be grabbing the entirely wrong town. So you have to have some confidence. And now the naturalization papers amongst those are the... Uh, is a little half a slip of paper that's supposed to be the ship that they came in on and the date that it arrived. So they did a little research for us. We have to thank them for that. Um, but uh, 
Passenger lists are a whole nother talk because uh, if you if if you actually have Italian ancestors and that's why you're here for this talk, you already know that people are you have the the grandfather and he has sons and the sons name their first son after their father, their first daughter after their mother, and of course sometimes there's a duplication if the mother's parents have the same names as the father's parents so they don't repeat but uh you get that kind of name repeating thing and as a result of that if one guy has eight sons who all live old enough to get married you have a whole bunch of first cousins with the same name and as a result of that you grab the wrong passenger list and it's not your dad or grandpa or whoever so uh, the good news is if you already, if you know you have the right family group, uh, or if they came over in a, in a cluster. Okay. So typically the father comes over by himself and then the mother and the kids come over later when the father has enough money to send home to get them over. That's kind of how it typically works. I hate to say everything or always or never. Uh, but anyway, it, it frequently. And so if you see the passenger list and it's got the mom and the four kids all with the right ages and it all matches up, you go, okay, I got the right family. And now I've got a town I can look for where they came from. That's always good. So passenger list can be very helpful. But if you're looking for Vito Russo, you might not want to start at the passenger list stage. Uh and then I say U.S. church records, but I, I will specifically say that uh, the old Italian parishes in Chicago, frequently marriages of two people born in Italy or the baptisms of their kids, frequently, not always, will list the town of origin of the groom and bride or the father and mother in the case of the baptism. Um, and, uh, I will say that the Polish church records almost never have it, even though the form is exactly the same, a place for that, it says ex loco. Yes. And says. on the Polish records, ex loco, they came from nowhere. They, they're blank. Mm -hmm. And when it's ex loco for the Italian parishes, uh, you do get, uh, better luck with those. So that, that's a good fallback. I didn't list it on this uh, slide, but I should have. Um, it depends on when, if you if you have people born in Italy who signed up for World War I or at least filled out the draft registration card, not all of them say the town, but some of them do. It's another shot at it. So you go to Family Search and you hunt down uh, the um, draft registration. And that's another place where you can... Uh, uh, Ac you know, accidentally trip over a, a town of birth, um, but sometimes it just says Italy. So again, you're throwing the dice. Okay, so I probably said all this stuff. Um, knowing when people came over is very difficult. What port they came through. I, I, I was talking about the National Archives. I spent a tremendous amount of time going through passenger lists there because there was no Ellis Island website yet. Um, I feel like a 90 year old grandfather back in my day, uh, but back in my day, um, there was, so you just sat there going through these sound X's and I couldn't find my grandfather or his siblings coming over at all. And, um, and there was just, a, a, you know, I, I kind of knew when they came over in the census records, you might get that number of years in the country, and hopefully that's uh, accurate. Um, not always, but sometimes it is. Um, but uh, that can help you narrow it down if you have, I mean, my my surnames, okay, Lituri, Santo Liquido, Abinanti. I mean, if there are those names, they're my family, okay? I lucked out. Uh, you know, De Niccolo, Russo, you know, there's a lot of common names and these methods just don't work that well with those. 
Uh, I say, is it the right veto? Because literally you could have eight first cousins and you may have the right. Again, if you're looking for the town, you're probably going to do OK, even if you get the wrong cousin. They're all from the same town, hopefully. Um, so you get at least a starting point there. The naturalization papers. Now, not everybody became a citizen. Uh, they might have died too early, never thought to go through the process. And I've noticed that some families, um, as it got to World War II and Italy was the enemy, um, people did one of two things. I, I, I can speak from my family and uh, outer branches of family experience, meaning my in the in-law relatives that were also Italian. Uh, if they had sons who were going into the service for their country, they were born here probably. Uh, but if the, if they had sons in, in the service and the stars in the window, the parents didn't always rush to get their citizenship taken care of. If they didn't have sons to go in the service, like they had a bunch of daughters or um, their kids were not of military age, then the parents said, mm, maybe we better profess our loyalty to our new country. Uh, in a formal way. So you, you, I've run into that a lot. I mean, my, my step grandfather's parents never bothered with citizenship because all four sons joined the service the minute they could. Um, in, in, even, even in their thirties, they, they signed up. So uh, none of them were drafted. So the, the parents were like, uh, we've done our part. So that's, the kind of a story. So anyway, not everybody becomes a citizen. And um, before 1922, if the husband became a citizen, that meant that the wife automatically got derivative citizenship from him. And the kids born over there got derivative citizenship from dad. I believe that's the case. Um, my grandfather I never found a citizenship paper for him. I found one for his stepdad. Um, yeah, my, yeah, you, th this is a group that doesn't, hasn't seen me before. So I get to use all my regular stuff here. Um, my grandfather's dad died on the day he arrived at Ellis Island, March 8th, 1906. Once I found that, I actually, I didn't know if he came through, because the rest of the family, as I was sit, saying and then distracted myself, they all came through Boston, but I didn't know that anybody came through Boston back in those days because I was young and naive and, and a self-taught idiot. So I didn't I didn't find any of them coming into the country. And so I didn't know. It's like, well, whatever happened to their, maybe their dad died over in Italy. And I found a death record in the Italian records that said that he died in Long Island College Ospedale, that's the word for hospital, of course, and um, it had a copy, an actual uh, copy in the microfilm of his death record from New York. Uh, I spent, a, and I spent, I didn't know, because Ellis Island, if he it said died at Ellis Island, well, Ellis Island's a federal property, who keeps their certificates if a baby's born on the island or somebody dies there turns out that they took him off the island to long island college ospedale that's uh in uh brooklyn despite the long island name and so he's in the king's county death record so i found him found him there so he he spent four hours in the united states um and the fact that they medically check everybody on the getting on the ship before they leave europe to make sure they wouldn't have to bring back sick people or bring sick people in. Uh, somebody did a real bad job of that because about 10 people in a row uh, all died on their first or, first or second day uh, from that ship in 1906. So yeah, I've had a lot of fun finding this stuff. So he didn't become a citizen is kind of the point. Um, and so I think I found from a sibling because his older brother became a citizen and um, yeah, and then his, his sister did not become a citizen because she got derivative citizenship from her husband and they married in Chicago. So I didn't know 
um, you know, based on that. Now, one thing you can find is if you find the citizenship for a husband, typically it will have the wife's birthplace on his paper. So if you're looking for that, that's one way to, to get at it. Okay. And then the church records I mentioned, um, depending on the ethnicity. And again, I'm maybe some of you are watching this talk because you're just a member of the group and you don't have Italian ancestry. Well, some of this stuff applies and could apply to your, uh, your records too. Uh, if you're, again, I can only speak for Chicago church records. Maybe it, in smaller towns, it didn't matter as much. Uh, but anyway, so again, oral history, I think I've hit this one to death. Everybody says the name of the big city. I mean, you know, when I was in Italy, um, they would ask me where I was from. I could figure that out. And I said, uh, you know, mi chiamo Dan, sono di Chicago. Okay, because Vernon Hills means nothing to them. So I say, sono di Chicago. And literally the 2003, the man's been dead a long time. Ah, Chicago, Al Capone. Eh, 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 eh. I'm not kidding. Little 90-year-old lady, Al Capone. No, Al Capone is morto. He's dead, you know. I, okay, you know, that's that's what you take these trips for. You get stories, you put them in your talks. I don't know. Um, so, but at least I knew where I was going. Like I say, the census we talked about doesn't list the town. Uh, one important piece of data that might be in there is number of years in the USA. I'm going to say that that piece of data is more accurate than the citizenship status. Um, and not to pick on anybody, I'm, but I can guarantee they weren't from this group. Uh, but a long time ago, somebody said that all of their they thought their ancestor was born in Italy, but they were born in Pennsylvania. And it's because there's the column that says PA, they filed their papers. PA, no, they're not from Pennsylvania. And by the way, they probably didn't file their papers either. I, I, a lot of the PAs in those census records, those were scared people that were afraid that the government was looking for reasons to send them back. And so they said, oh, we filed our papers. We filed our papers. I would have done the same thing. Um, so uh, that status doesn't always indicate that they've filed their papers. Um, but when you see that, be diligent in checking it out. Uh, the only good thing about the census is that you have families where, and, and my great-grandparents' family was the same. I went, um, the last half of the story, in case it comes in here, is that after great grandpa died, great grandma, they sent the paper back. That's the only way. I'm, I don't, you know, maybe she wrote letters and they never got answered. How do you find out? You don't place a transatlantic telephone call in 1906 and say your your husband's dead, uh, or he found a place to live, or anything. So basically, they didn't. Um, um, the piece of paper getting sent back to Italy, and that came from the that came from the passenger list. If it didn't say Trigiano on the passenger list as his last residence, uh, they would not have known where to send it from, and she would have just said, "Oh, my husband left me and left me with four kids." So since she found that out, okay, she now had proof that she was a widow, and it was about nine months after his death that she married again. Now, that sounds like a short period of time to us, but when you've got four kids to raise, uh, you need somebody earning money. So, and so you will find gaps of two to three months sometimes between the death of a spouse and the remarriage. And frequently, not, a lot of the marriages were arranged. The remarriages were, were quite often arranged between a widow, a widower, and a widow. Um, in the case of my great grandma, she married uh, an unmarried man. That was that's quite rare when they get widowed at a young age over there. So just kind of know that going in. And again, U.S. death certificates rarely list the town of birth. Uh, so you know, again. 
if you got nothing else to go by and you've got a copy of the death certificate, you can get a lot of them on family search. Um, if there's time toward the end and you don't know this, um, I'll try to slip some of that in there so that you find that stuff out. Um, real quick, because I know that this group's going to know all this stuff, but again, about Italian records, if you're not familiar with how they're set in family search, um, the good news is that as with everything else on family search, it's 100% free. No one's going to ask for a credit card and all that good stuff. Um, the bad news is that a lot of the Italian civil records that are on family search are restricted. And if you're a veteran genealogist, you already know what that means. It's that little tiny camera with a key above it. Uh, that means, nope, you can't do this at four o'clock in the morning at home. You have to go to either Family History Center. I think these are the closest ones to you guys. If you've got any others that you know about, then you know about them. But I did a little map hunting. And they're now called, by the way, if you didn't see the memo, they're now called family search centers rather than family history centers. I don't know why, but that's so when you hear that term, it's not something different. And then affiliate library, which includes this one, correct? Okay. Um, and all you got to do is go to family search, click on the uh, little pinpoint, looks like a map pinpoint, and you can search for whatever's closest to you there. I mean, maybe. Maybe you don't live in the New Lenox area, but you know about this talk, um, and you can find that uh, find a there. Um, so affiliate library and family search typically have the same access as each other for Italian records. I know there are records you literally have to go to Salt Lake City to view. There are other records that are viewable at a family search center, but not at an affiliate library. But those are pretty rare. Um, so, all right, so what kind of records are there? All right, for those of you who don't know your Italian records, here's the crash course. Okay, civil records in Italian, they're typically formatted um, over a period of years, the same format with text typed, and then a line where they wrote in handwriting the information that belong there, okay? Um, the formats are quite similar uh, in terms of the words that are on the document, even if the form looks quite different. Um, basically, 1875 through the 19, late mid 1940s look pretty much the same. 1866 to 1874 are longhand, handwritten. There's no typescript. They're the most horrible, awful, nasty records to read because if the guy, I, I, I keep thinking that the guy that was the clerk in my town used to be the carpenter and, you know, and made some mistakes in his carpentry. And they said, we got to make you, the world safe. So we're going to put you as the town clerk. It didn't make the world safe. And then 1809 to 1865, there are different formats, but quite similar in their content. So we have birth records. They may say nati or nashita uh, as the um, what they are, because the catalog will have, even the catalog will be in Italian. So you got to be able to work your way around that. Matrimonial, obviously, is marriages. Deaths, ATTI is act. act. ATTI is the plural of act. So acts of birth, acts of marriage, and acts of death. So the wedding bands. Um, so those of you that are Catholic and would read the bulletin and it would say second bands for this couple about to get married, that's an old custom. Uh, so Italy has those. Um, I don't find them particularly useful, except when, for some reason, the atti di matrimonio of that year uh, is missing, or they forgot to film it, or something else, or there's pages missing from the book, 
So you go to the bands and at least you can confirm what year uh, somebody got married. There are other kinds of records for that too. Ah, that would be these. Okay. This is not, this is a beginner class. So we're not going to talk at length about allegati or processetti. Okay. But these are records. If you're lucky, they go all the way back to 1809. Um, if you're like me, <laughs> not lucky, uh, they go back to 1866. What they are is the supporting documents for a marriage. Um, I even found a little bit of this, my mom and dad. Luckily, my mother's a pack rat, so she saved things that many people would have thrown away by now. Well, that's good. Good for me. Um, and so they had, they had documents. They had to go back to the churches where they were baptized and get a copy of their baptism from that new, you know, whoever the parish priest was then, and bring that to the parish where they were going to get married to say, yes, we were baptized Roman Catholic, whatever, you know, any papers they needed from the church. So in this case, these are papers from the government for the government. So what this is, is that, okay, so here a couple's going to get married in 1900. So now in order to do that, they have to get a copy of their own birth record. Now there's no Xerox machine. Somebody's got to write it all out. So they called it estrato, an extract. And if you write to Italy for any reason, and you expect them to send you back the actual copy of the actual record, you will never, ever get one. You will get an extract. Because by law, they're not supposed to make Xerox or other kinds of copies of the original physical records and send them to you. So just know that some of you may have written to Italy and didn't go well, and that's why you're here. But anyway, it, the good news is that for us, for, for the microfilm and for all this stuff, are copies of the actual original records. So we get to see them, but we ask for them from Italy, and they're not allowed to give them to us. I guess by the agreement they gave to uh, um, the um, Genealogical Society of Utah or the Mormons, whatever, uh, they did, uh, you know, they agreed to, yes, take copy the actual records. Um, I don't know if anybody would have sat and rewritten them. But anyway, um, so, you, so you're getting married. So eat, the bride and the groom each have to get a copy of their uh, birth record. If either of them were widowed, they'd have to bring a copy of the death record of their deceased former spouse. And if they're, especially if one of their fathers was deceased, by the time the young couple got married, they would have to have a copy of that death record as well. Um, that's some incredibly important stuff, especially if the dad died in a completely different town or the United States, you know, I, none of his, none of my great grandfather's children got married in Italy. So I don't have any Allegati records to um, confirm, you know, his, his death that way. Um, uh, I'm not even sure about the remarriage that happened in Italy when my great grandma remarried. So I'm actually bringing up a question to myself: Would his death would had been in his in her uh, remarriage allegati? Because it should have been. So, but anyway, I think I found it elsewhere. But the the allegati, the bad news is, is that they have a title page for each marriage that says the name of the bride and the groom on it, and then they have page after page after page after page. Uh, some of it is this good stuff that I just mentioned, and some of it is just documents that they signed that are genealogically of minimal significance. Uh, but they're really, really good, but they're for another day if you haven't. Uh, if you've done a bunch of Italian research and you're going, geez, I just can't find the birth record of so-and-so, okay, well, you might find it in the Allegati for that marriage. It's just going to be a lot of going through pages to, to, to get go to it. Um, Okay, the good news is that if your family's from Southern Italy and about 80% of American uh, Italian descendants, are, their families are from the South. That's where things were lousiest. That's where people left from. 
they didn't have any options in life uh, except to be a farmer on somebody else's land and they didn't dig it. So they said, we're out of here. So that would be a reason they would have left. And, uh, and when I say restricted, that was the thing. I'm going to show you what that means if you don't know it. Um, but again, a lot of the records you're not going to be able to view on familysearch.org sitting at home. Well, why can I view it at a family history center or an affiliate library and not view it at home? Well, those libraries have things installed on their routers or on their networks or whatever that when you request the website, it says, yep, this guy's got permission, okay? So my goal is to open up my own family history center located at my house, and I'm the only patron, and I'm the only staff member, okay? But I'm here 24 seven, um, but yeah, they tend to frown at They say, well, okay, so where's your church building? I don't have one. Where's your library you know, building? I don't have one, okay, so. That's that's how tough it is. Now, if your family is from northern Italy, well, uh, some parts of northern Italy are well microfilmed and other parts are very poorly microfilmed. The best I can suggest of why is that the north of Italy, oh, and I, normally at this point in the talk, I would say, hey, who can tell me which European world leader is responsible for people doing these records in Italy. And most people don't know. And since I can't say, raise your hand here, uh, I'll just answer the question. It's Napoleon. Napoleon invaded a bunch of places. And then he says, I know, uh, let's do record keeping. So I know who I'm in charge of. Great, great idea. So, of course, Northern Italy probably took the brunt of the military part of his taking over than the South did. The South got taken over by a lot of people over the decades and centuries. But uh, when the time came and they, you know, Napoleon was out and uh, exiled for the first time, the Northern Italians are like, well, uh, this, this was Napoleon's idea. We don't like this idea. This is a theory. I don't know if it's really true. The Southern Italians who didn't get demolished in any way were like, eh, not so bad, well, let's keep records. And we know who's here and who's not. Um, so the, the Southern Italian records, it's not a matter that they filmed more of those records by some accident or whatever, or that the Northern Italian um, uh, archives were more restrictive or run by somebody who didn't want to let them in, um, then, uh, you know, they're, they're um, like I say, when we, when we talk about church records, and again, that's not for a beginner class, but church records um, are, were very limited because during the periods in which they were running around Italy trying to do all this microfilming, um, it would probably have been in the 70s, maybe late 60s for a lot of it. And it was Pope Paul VI at the time, back, back when the Pope was Italian. Um, never thought I'd say that phrase, but here we are. You know, we haven't had an Italian Pope in 44 years. But Pope Paul basically told the bishops of Italy, if you want to, if your churches want to let that other church come in and microfilm things, go ahead and we'll we'll talk later. It, it was enough. From what I was led to understand, it was sort of a veiled threat as though, okay, we're going to send you on a, you know, you're going to be parish priest in outer Mongolia if you let anybody film your records. So most people didn't want to take the chance at it. And so they, they didn't, uh, they didn't do that. Uh, some still did. And I guess they weren't sent to outer Mongolia, but I guess I don't know either. Um, there's a place in Family Search that if you haven't been there in a while, um, it's a place to check. It's called Search Images. I'm going to try to find some time in here to um, uh, at least show you a little bit of that, although a lot of the images that I found um, got um, moved into the catalog, and so I can't show them as images anymore, but I can at least show you how it operates, and then you can try it for your town 
Um, and if you if you haven't been in the catalog for your town, this is how I found it. My catalog had 1809 to 1900 for a long time. And then all of a sudden in the province, somebody went to the provincial archives and they filmed 1901 to 1929. And then a bunch of other stuff that were, were missed uh, and Allegati stuff and all kinds of things. So they filmed a whole bunch of stuff, but it, because it didn't appear in Trigiano, I never saw it. Um, I don't know of any other province that did it that way. I don't like how it's cataloged, but I, I guess I understand it. And then, uh, so it was up to 1929 for the longest time. And then this thing, search images, what does that mean? And I finally went in and looked and all of a sudden they had 1930 to 1945 for my town buried in these images. And so I went crazy. You, you might have even heard me yell from here uh, when that came out several years ago. So um, if I hear you yell, I'll know. Oh, yeah, they found something in the images that they didn't know they had. It's going to be typically more recent rather than older. Okay, so reading Italian records. Um, I'm going to show some of that when we get into family search with an actual record on the screen, but this is just some basic stuff about reading it. Because I, you know, I don't know what I was thinking when I said, I'm gonna research this and read records in a language that I don't know. Um, so yeah, you don't need to be fluent in Italian. I am living proof, okay? So there on family search, you can go into an area called the wiki. If you have not gone into the wiki, you must spend about a month in there because it's a lot of methodology that will get into more detail than I can in this talk. And it will also give you a lot of the keywords you need to know to read the documents. It's incredibly helpful no matter what part of the world you're working in. Um, and, uh, but before there was a wiki, Okay, I mean, I, I've, I've got a bunch of Italian English dictionaries. I don't carry them anymore because I rarely hit a word that I don't know in the documents. Um, occupation list is good if you want to keep track of that, but you're going to find out that practically everybody in your town is the same. You know, if they're near the seaport, they're fishermen. If they're not near the seaport, they're probably, uh, like I say, contadini, peasant farmers, but who knows? Um, so you need to know you especially need to know months and numbers. They write the numbers like the year. They don't put 1875 for 1875. They write the word mille ottocento settanta cinque. So they weren't known for efficiency. They're the, the, the word's this long. You got to be able to take that and quickly turn that into what year you're in when you're rummaging through these records so that you know what you're looking at. Otherwise, you're going to waste a lot of time in the wrong year. Um, and um, the months are typically similar to ours, so they're not too bad. But once in a while, you get into an index, and it says 7BRE, 7 brain. OK, you see a 7 and you think it's a month. Guess what? You're going to call it July, right? Sette is seven, bre, septembre, it's September. You get seven bre, eight bre, October, nine bre, November. Okay, so you're two months off if you don't know that little tip. Okay, I don't even know if that's in my handout. Um, I, I might have a more thorough and detailed handout uh, with some things in it that I won't be able to cover today if you're like ready for step two in this process. Uh, and again, the first handout's got my email address on it. Send me an email and say, please throw me the second handout. And I'll be more than happy to throw that at you. And uh, you might get some more of these kind of little tips. Um, if you're new to this, bring a translated record with you. I had a, I was very lucky. Again, self-taught idiot. I well, my, my coworkers only are half of that. <laughs> but um, there were three of us 
who are all doing Italian research at the Buffalo Grove Family History Center. And I don't know how big the local family history centers are by you guys, but this one, my, my kitchen table, and it's just the size of an ordinary kitchen table, is about the size of that center. It's not a big room. And there were five readers in it. And only one of the readers had uh, the high magnification lens. And that's the only kind. The Italian microfilm, luckily, you kind of don't have to deal with that anymore. But the Italian microfilm was always the little skinny microfilm rather than that thicker film um, or wider film. So the three of us would all get there and almost do battle to we one of us, all three of us needed the high mag lens and only one of us would get it. So we kind of grumbled and we looked at the postage stamp that was on the other reader and that was all we got. Uh, but at least three of us knew were researching Italian records and could help with the translation at the beginning when I did no idea what I was reading. Uh, there was no book about it really then. So that was a big, big plus. And uh, so the, the take my hand out with you the first time you're reading an Italian record. So you at least have a guide to how it looks. And um, uh, that's that's a good way to start. Uh, as I said, the the, the, old, the newer records are partly typed, partly handwritten. Practically nothing is fully typed on an Italian record. Um, maybe you'll be lucky and they, they will have typed it, but the, the vast majority they didn't. Okay, so this is going to be stuff that I think this group's probably going to know, but I'm going to go through it real quick. Start with the immigrant ancestor. No kidding. Okay. Um, so... First, you got to find that birth record, because I'm unless you've been doing genealogy for a while, I'm going to guess, and I'm going to do this at my uh, fan, uh, Casa Italia talk at the end of the month. I'm going to give them all a blank family tree chart, and when I say family tree chart and they don't know what I'm talking about, I say, okay, take the NCAAs and take one half of it that goes gets bigger towards the right, and you're the champion in the middle. Um, and then when they don't know what the NCAAs are, I had I have to say, okay, the World Cup. <laughs> You're the champion of this division, okay? And fill in what you can. And I'm going to say, okay, fill in your parents. You know that. Fill in your grandparents. Um, get a lot of Italians that are going to go, well, yeah, I knew my grandma, but she was called Nona. What was her name? I don't know. If I used her name, I would have been hit with the spoon, okay? So they don't know the names, okay? That's that's a cultural thing that they didn't, you know. And um, great grandparents, okay. Not often you had people living to that advanced age, born that early and coming over here. And great great grandparents, okay. If you've never done this before, the odds of you listing your great great grandparents are slim and none, and slim left town, okay. Um, so to get back that far, and I'll tell you right now, if you can get back to your great, great grandparents and maybe one generation beyond that for some of them, you're going to impress any friend you have who's not already in your genealogy group. Okay. Or at your family history center that, you know, family history center. Of course, I run into somebody, oh, I tied into the Royal line. I go back to 980 BC. Well, good for you. Have you checked all that data? Well, I, I, okay, right. When you check it and it's all confirmed and sourced, let me know. Um, I'm happy to say I'm back to the mid 1600s on a bunch of lines and the late 1600s on the rest of them. And I got one great, great grand on the Italian. And I got one great, great grandfather who was a foundling. And I should mention them. You may look for a birth record and you may not find it. Uh, and you'll be like, but I've got the town and I've got the name and why is he not here? One record type I did not mention, you might want to scribble this down somewhere, is called Ati Diversi. Not spelled like the street in Chicago, D-I-V-E-R-S-I. -E uh, and Diversi means diverse acts. Uh, and one of the things that's in there is that if a child was born illegitimately, and neither parent wanted to be known, uh, you know, that, that basically the parent would, mother, would take the baby and 
give it to the church. If you if you saw the episode of MASH where somebody just left a baby at the camp and then they said, well, there's no hope. We got to take the baby to the uh, convent or the orphanage or whatever. And so they put it in this little thing and then spun it around and because they're not supposed to talk to the monks or whatever. They did that in Italy too. And your ancestor may very well have been uh, gone through that. And if they were, their birth record might be in the Atti Diversi. Now those, on, those ended in 1865. Everybody after that is in the regular birth record. So, uh, but I, because of this, I have a great, great grandfather who does not have known parents. And so I am hoping that I can find somebody in my DNA um, who is a cousin I do not know of. Believe me that at this stage, oh, I, I guess I didn't mention at the beginning that I traced my ancestry as far back as I could into the 1600s. And then I've traced the descendants of those ancestors as far forward as I can. So I've got well over 90,000, probably 95,000 at this stage in my tree. That's 30 years work. That's not running into the royal line or somebody with a giant tree um, with just a bunch of data. I don't like throwing a bunch of data into my file without checking it first. Um, and therefore, anybody's tree that's that big is just going to hurt me. Uh, but uh, at any rate, um, having done all that, I know who all my, I certainly know my first cousins. I know my second cousins. I know my third cousins personally. I know my fourth cousins by name in my mind. Fifth cousins, okay, I, I need the computer at that point. So if I find somebody on the DNA who is a cousin that absolutely couldn't connect to me if I tried, now they're going to connect to me from some other line because I know the whole town. But uh, when I when they when it says third cousin on ancestry, and my computer says ninth cousin, I know I've got a winner. That person is comes from the same line as great great grandpa, and I'm going to finally identify at least who he comes from. And I need to go to some DNA talks and figure out how to attack that. I know every group's got a thousand DNA speakers. That's the one topic I don't speak on because I don't know enough about it. I've had some good luck, but I'm not doing it the scientific way and I really got to do that. Okay. Um, why does this say it will have the names of the and then leaves it blank? I need to fix my PowerPoint. Um, it will have the names of the parents. It will have um, the age of the father of the baby, typically not the mother. Um, sometimes it'll have a grandparent listed, but if you've got a lot of people in town where they have a lot of names that repeat, and I actually, I've got one person who both of his wives were called Mariana Adante. I've got the death record of the first one, and I've got the remarriage to a second woman with exactly the same name. When you've been at this as long as I have, you run into weird stuff. And the, a direct descendant of this mess could not figure out why they couldn't, it didn't make any sense. And I'm like, I, yeah, he married two women with the same name, not cousins of each other, completely unrelated. Um, and then I got another one where I've got two exactly the same name, bride and groom, bride and groom, who were um, married within a year of one another in the same town with all different sets of parents. They, it was not a remarriage. It was not a annulment. Couldn't believe it. And it's like, well, great. How do, how do I know which of their kids belongs with which one? Well, Francesco, one of them suddenly became Francesco Paolo or Francesco di Giuseppe, son of Giuseppe, Francesco di Michele, son of Michael. And that helped me figure it out. Ugh, you know, you might face this someday. I, I hope you don't. But you, if you do, you're going to go, yeah, I remember that speaker guy. So anyway, basic method, find the parents, now go the next thing, don't worry about the brothers and sisters and all that other stuff first, or, and, and please don't, don't start your research with, I'm going to get everybody with the same surname in this town. That may be a huge mistake. You might end up with 800 people and, you know, 2% of them are actually related to you. You know, when you go back to the church records, 
in Italy, yes, everyone will connect. All the branches are going to intertwine with each other. And <clears throat> when you're just doing the civil records, people know who their certain levels of grandparentage are. And they're, they're most of the time they know they're not marrying a cousin. Sometimes they do know they're marrying a cousin. And they get a paper signed in that Allegati that says it's okay. The bishop says it's okay. Uh, marriage record of the parents. So I would typically start with the birth of the of the child you know of and go backward. Now that saved me a lot of time because I knew my grandpa's brother was born in 1898. So I started with 1898 itself. No marriage, went to 1897, there they were. Okay, it might not be that easy. If you find that your an immigrant ancestor's father is 47 years old, Chances are that marriage might be quite a ways back, but you don't know. Could have married a younger second wife or something. So it'll give you the ages and birthplaces of the parents, and then it will give you the parents' names. Let me say this about marriage records. The ages that are listed on them are incredibly, incredibly accurate. You wouldn't have expected me to say that. Uh, the ages on the death records in Italy are incredibly, incredibly inaccurate, unless it's an infant or a small child, uh, that you would have expected me to, because death records ages are not always good. Um, so basically, so you start with the immigrant ancestor, you get his parents from the birth record, now you've got them, you get to the marriage record and you get four more parents. Every marriage record you find going back you're going to get four more ancestors out of it on the same generation. And so basically lather, rinse, and repeat. And now if you can't find a marriage for a couple, probably means one of them was from another town. You're going to run into that. Uh, and you might not get a, a, a giveaway. What you're going to find in, in this particular instance is, is this situation real quick. Um, so you're going to, you're going to find Russo and Guerra getting married and you can't find the marriage, but you go, okay, Russo and Guerra, um, the, I look in the index of marriages and I find tons and tons of Guerras and very few Russos. So Russo's probably from another town. So uh, at that now, I'm picking the wrong name for this example, but you get what I mean. You, you may have to do a little bit of searching in the towns that are nearby. Um, you know, back in these eras, they've got, you know, a mule. You know, they didn't have supersonic flight. They didn't have a lot of things. So uh, they didn't travel a tremendous distance to get married. Now, once they were in the United States, who knows who they met in what neighborhood in Chicago or, or elsewhere. Um, so you might go back and you might run into that snag. And so you kind of need to find out, all right, where are some of these other names, which ones are more popular or less popular in the town that you're working in? And you will have to straddle off into another town, probably if you're going to go back to, you know, great to the third grandparents. Okay, so here's where it gets to be a little diff difficult and maybe different than what you're used to uh, with whatever research you've done so far. So to find a record, the records, again, are all kept by the small town. If you see the word comune, C-O-M-U-N-E, looks like commune, uh, but it's okay. So in that, now you need to go year by year because they don't, they typically don't give you an index. You're going to once in a while find a decennial index, which is like 10 years worth of, of indexes mushed together in one big, that was, that was their early attempt at a database uh, or even a spreadsheet, but at, at, not every town has one and it doesn't always give you the information you need to, to know that you're finding the right person. So you're searching year by year. Each year has an index, maybe. Um, 
the index could be at the beginning of that year or it could be at the end of that year. Who decided that? Depended on who wrote it and how they did the book back before it was filmed. So you're going to have to get used to your town and it might change. All of a sudden in 1848, the indexes are now in the beginning of the records of that year. That When I say the index, meaning the births of 1848 index, it will be in the beginning before the first record of 1848 births. And for some stupid reason, the 1847 births, it's at the end. You'll just have to get used to your town keeper's method. Sometimes the indexes are sorted by last name. Sometimes they're sorted by first name. Isn't that lovely when everybody's named Francesco, Giovanni, Giuseppe, Michele, okay? You, then you get a lot of names clustered together. At that point, you're going to pray for a Benedetta, you know, uh, somebody who's, uh, you know, whose name is a little less common. Um, so those are, you'll, you'll find that out too when you're going through them. Okay, so now, oh, one other wonderful thing. Uh, they don't always index purely at, uh, alphabetically. So all of the people whose name starts with the letter A will be in chronological order in your index. So, so we have all these names with an A and they have numbers next to them. They won't necessarily have the parents there for you to go, that's the one I'm looking for because those are the parents I want, okay? So you're gonna just have to read through. And, and that when I said earlier that if your family is truly from a big city, if they're from Naples, Milan, Bari, um, even the index is a nightmare because you have four pages of index just for the letter C. And it's in just everybody whose last name starts with a C is, chronologically in that mess. So find the name and its date or its number. Okay, so let's talk quickly about indexes. 1865 and before, uh, frequently the index says, here's the name, here's the date. We're going to talk about the dates in a second. Here's the parents and here's a number. Okay. So what does that all mean? The number may not have anything to do pre-1865. It may not have anything to do with the number of the record you're looking for in these images. Um, we're kind of we're kind of jumping into a a little bit of advanced, but it's hard to get started with beginner if you don't run know that you're going to run into this. Um, I'll tell you what, let me let me focus on post-1866 because honestly, it, you're you're probably going to be looking there first. Those indexes, and I will show you what they look like when I go into family search very quickly here. It has the index has the name and it has a number. It does not have the parents. So if you got Vito, you might have seven Vito Russos born in that year. And what does that mean? It means you got to check all seven of them if you're in the right year, okay? Um, you got to write down all seven of those numbers and then go to each one and look at it. Is it the right date that you're expecting? Is it the right parents that you're expecting? If you don't know the date or the parents, you're going to have a hard time if it's a common name, okay? So you need some backup to tell you what you're hunting for. Okay, pre-1866 indexes show the pair, person and the parents and a date. I would ignore that number. I would use the date and go through those records um, by date until you find who you're looking for. Uh, the post-1866 indexes do not give you a date. They do not give you parents most of the time. And, uh, and they just give you that number. And then you got to find the record with that number. That's kind of what I just said, sequential record number. Okay, so go through the images. Okay, I'm going to move my soda away from my hand movement because I have to get into family search now. Okay, so let me stop the share momentarily and... 
do a new share. And let's hope it stays on this screen. Okay, much easier. All right. So you now see family search. Okay. Okay, yeah, let me give you some more bad news. I got lots of bad news, just like work. <laughs> um, you might be thinking, oh, I know family search. I'm going to go search records and I'm going to look for my ancestor there. You can look for them if you're looking for the naturalization, especially in Illinois. Um, you can look for a lot of things, the draft cards, the Catholic Church records, maybe. But your vast, vast majority of Italian uh, civil records are not indexed on family search. Okay. I'm going to show you that you might see some that are indexed, and that will help you because my town. They pick one film and they index that one film and they never did anything else after that. I don't know what to say for the towns your families are coming from, okay? So I wanna go to catalog first because, you know, again, let's just say that I've done all of this other hard work and I've determined where my family is from. They're not from the city of Bari, they're from Trujan, okay? So I'm typing the name and I'm using um, I'm using the um, Microsoft browser. You're probably better off using Chrome, um, but this I, I'm fine with this. It works for what I'm doing. So you type in the name and it flips the order. You do need to pick it from their list. And again, you probably know all this stuff, but I want to show you what you're going to run into. Okay. So I have Trajano Bari, Italy, civil registration, and it's got a number three there. It means there's three different possibilities. So you got to pick one of these, okay? So now we have a Trajano Stato Civile. That's the word, those are the words you typically want to see. Those are the civil records. But now this doesn't list any dates on it. And then down here, it says Tribunale 1936 to 1945. So you see that there's Archivo di Stato di Bari, so the, the this, this provincial archives, what they call a province that would be like Cook County, Lake County, Will County, um, and um, so those are that. So the Bari, so they they got them from the archives. So basically, these are recopies of records that are in the local town. They felt it was easier to go to the archives and negotiate for a whole bunch of towns all at one time with one guy rather than going to each individual town and finding out that the guy at town number seven is a jerk or you know whatever so they did all that and that's part of where they filmed some of these things so these are may not even be the original records they were copies made at the time so some poor guy sitting there handwriting and probably got bored made some mistakes i found a lot of them um Okay, so then there's this Tribunale, Tribunale di Bari. I don't even know what that is. And then here, Registri dello Stato Civile, Trigiano Bari, 1809 to 1900, comma 1920. I will not get into why there's a 1920 buried in the midst of this. It's miscatalogued, and I can't seem to get anybody there to understand why, but that's okay. So I'm going to click on this one to show you the most stuff here. Okay. I'm going to move my little window of people out of the way so it will see me. You might occasionally get this to come up, translate page from Italian. I haven't really done that. Um, this is, I, I want you to see, oh, okay, I signed in so long ago that I'm no longer signed in. Let's fix that. Because it might affect what you see. So, now... Just so you just so you know that a case, now I don't know about other provinces that ever did anything like this, but see also Bari Provincia, 1866 to 1929. Um, if you see that, that might be more records for your town. Um, if I have a little bit of time, I'll try to show you what it is. Um, records of Italy, Bari, civil registration are available online. Click here. Well. Um, you really want to see which ones are indexed. You're probably not going to run into too much. Um, but I want to get down to the 
actual films, folders, image group numbers, whatever they call them. Okay, anyone who has ever been in Family Search has already seen the ubiquitous camera with a key on it, which means, nope, not at four in the morning in my bunny slippers. You can't do it. So those are going to be ones that are restricted, and you need to go to the New Lenox Library or to a Family Search, formerly known as Family History Center, uh, the libraries I listed earlier. So you see that you see all those little keys, whole bunch of keys. Ironically, the 1920, the one that's miss uh, uh, catalog, it says, hey, it doesn't have a key. I can browse these images online. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen, in this particular instance, it's wrong. It would kill me if it actually came up. Okay, so restricted. This is everybody in this group. I'm sure has seen this when they've clicked on the camera uh, with the key on it and it says, nope, you don't get to see this stuff. So, but let's see. So basically from 1809 to 1900, all of these are restricted. Get used to this folks, okay? But now what's this? <clears throat> Nati, those are births of course. 1877 to 1893, and look, we have a little magnifying glass. Okay, now I want you all to know from my experience that um, sometimes there'll be a magnifying glass and you'll go, oh, great, I can search that film. And then it turns out there's only like four records that were indexed out of that entire film, and yet it somehow rates a magnifying glass. You might run into that situation, so don't be surprised if you do. I happen to know differently. These are searchable. I didn't do this either. I didn't create the index. So I have to keep moving things. All right, so 22,000 results. And now those of you that are used to this screen, this number is the group number. It's not the film number, but it's the group number for this film when they gave it the other set of numbers. So by having that here, anything I search for will not be found anywhere else except in this film or folder number. So good, I don't get all the other people uh, that I don't want to see right now. I want to see people born in Trajano during this time frame. OK, so that limits things. That's helpful. So I'm going to search for my great grandmother. Now, I happen to know that she's misspelled. Two different two different um, transcribers looked at the spelling on the record and came up with the wrong spelling and that's the spelling that's in there this part a pillow with an e the first record on this page on the left um there's a bunch of them misspelled and they're the same parents as the one part pillow with an i if you take a look at the first four records on this page uh so part a pillow with an e part a pillow with an i turns out i is correct e is not okay so you're going to run into that stuff. So again, I hope you know it's a whole course in learning how to use wildcards and all that stuff. So I'm going to hit search because I don't have to worry about finding any Ana Santa Liquidos. I don't have to fill in any of these other fields. And I don't have to go down here and change the type and say birth, which typically one would want to do when you're searching for something specific. I don't have to do that because I happen to know I'm in a birth film. So I hit search. Rot row, she's not in here. That's not good. Well, that's because I happen to know that it got misspelled. I think it's it's that. No, then it might be the Q. When you when you search for any name with a Q and you don't find it. Put a G in there, because that's what a lot of people read. 
So I'm going to do that because I actually expected to find it, and now I haven't. Because what I want you to see is the record. Okay, well, she's born in 1879. She should be in here. So the O is the problem. But what the heck? Let's just take a look at a different record. So we have an Anna Santoro, which because of the asterisk I picked up. So the parents are here on the screen. That helps. So you don't have to read seven Vito Russo's here. You can pick the one that's the right set of parents. Okay. So this is to view the record details because we can't view the image actually on here. I'm going to have to um, pick something else that has an image that we can actually see. I'll go to one of the other archives here. See, it says check image availability. And it says, nope, you got to be at a family search center, an affiliate library, or you go to another website. Okay, so we know that. And document information, I highly recommend that you go through as you acquire any of these records, write these numbers down and record them somewhere in the family tree as a source or as a where you can find it again. And and this number too, the certificate number, okay? Anna was born January 4th. She's certificate number 13 in the year of 1891. So um, that way, you know, get all this stuff recorded. And that way, when you need to go back and get it, you can always get it. This, this applies to any record you get from Family Search. I know you can try to download it. You can take a picture with your phone, all that stuff. But you know what? Just have it down so that you know, and that's when somebody else gets a copy of your tree later on, they'll be able to use the microfilm or the folder number and the image number to go back. Uh, I do it that way rather than record the URL because I'm afraid that if they change the URL, all, they'll all be invalid. I mean, all it'll take is one guy to say, we're going to change how it's stored and structured, and now all the URLs are no good. But the film number is not going to change. The image number shouldn't change. And the certificate number is part of the data on the record. That won't change. So let's see, where do they have, I got to, see, I was going to look for this at work today, and then they gave me work to do. So we need to find something. I mean, if it's searchable, at least you have something and you can back it up. You got the parents, you got the date. And if you're at a family search center, when you would have clicked on that image, you would have gotten and at New Lenox Library, you would have gotten the um, actual, taken you right to the image. Uh, but this is, we're going to show how this actually works for those that don't have indexed uh, data. I got to pick another town. So back to search results. So it's got the place there. Okay, let's see. Um, all right, Term let me try Termini Marese Palermo. Now, just to show you what's in here. So there's a, this one's got a census. Are you going to get an Italian census? Very, very rarely. Very rarely. Uh, there's different censuses, but they go back 1583 to 1816. Rivelli di Benedianime. So it's a list of people who are living it's going to be like with 80 year jumps, you're not going to be able to do a lot of ancestry from that. Civil registration, got another one from the archive and we've got this one, 1820 to 1910. So let's take a look. If this doesn't work, I know one, one town just came to mind that will work. So you see more cameras with keys on them. I don't know how this looks on, on your end, but Still cameras, got a lot of searching you can do, but still we have the problem with the camera. And come on. Okay, this whole, okay, we got a second screen. Hold your, cross your fingers, folks. There we go. We got Aligati. I don't want to show you Aligati, not today. Okay. Where's births? All right, we've got some births here. 
let's do, let's find my great uncle's dad. So birth, not, you, you notice mine, I think said Nati, these say Nashite. Um, so there's different words depending, it, it, you know, you, you get to deal with dialect, but not on the records. That's the good part. So since this is a camera, we're going to click on that. So now here's the tricky part. And I really got to cover this quickly because we're going to run out of minutes here. Okay, any of you who've used Family Search already know you get these thumbnails. You've got an image number here. And that's why I say record the image number because you can jump to image number 842 by just typing that in. Okay, so I zoom in on this. Okay, and it says Ani 1886. Okay, good. That's the year. That saves a lot of pain. Because here's how you got to find the year the hard way. This is a birth record. Actually, it's half of a birth record. The other half is at the, on the next page over. So if you didn't know what year you were in, then you got to read it from up here. And this is all on the in the handout. You don't have to look at the handout, but the handout explains how these records are formatted. La Ano, the year. Mili Otto, 18, Cento, 100, 1800. Ot, and then it continues. Those are T's. They may look like L's to some of you. Those are T's without a cross. Otto, Cento, Otanta, say. Without a long explanation, it means 1886. Now, I happen to be looking for my granduncle's dad, who I know from his naturalization was born in 1888. So this is the trick. Now you have a film that contains 1886-19 19 whatever, 1897 or something. So how do you get to 1888? Okay, there's a couple of ways to do it. You can go back here and you can scroll this up and look for another one of these black pages that has a a, a, a number on it. And then you can zoom in on that. Now, this is a black page, but it doesn't have a number on it. Okay, what does this say? Let's zoom in. And it says, okay, Anno 1887. So you use that. You're going to have a, there's going to be a cover page for each year most of the time. So what you want to do then is I'm going, okay, I want to go to 1888. Well, I only got to go to the next page like that. And it will be the beginning of the 1888 records. So this is a monumental pain if you got to go through, you know, you, you, you know, if you got to jump through 60 years of records in one film. But if you have 60 years of records in one film, you probably have a very tiny little town, and it won't be that bad. So we've got some, we've got several of these back to back here. So I wonder what that is. Um, I'm going to jump to this one. And it does say, uh, I want to zoom it in for you guys, 1888. Now, here, here's one other thing you're going to run into. More bad news. Uh, you might have more than one town on a particular film. So the town that is alphabetically just before Termini Imerese, is might have the end of its records at the beginning of a film, and then in the middle of the film, suddenly that ends, and now it's the beginning of the records for Termini Imerese. So you want to know what town, municipio, comune, you want to know what town you're in, or you're going to go, well, I looked for the record, and I didn't find it. Okay? Self-taught idiot. I had to find out the hard way, too. But in this case, I've got the right town. Now, right after that is another title page. See, Provincia di Palermo. They told me he was from Palermo. He's from a town near Palermo. But I'm now in the beginning of the records. Okay, so it takes me right to an actual double page here of records. The number here 
is the number you're going to see in the index as soon as I find it. Okay, and in this case, the number is a number. Good thing. The year, remember we saw 1886, mili otto cento Say that three times fast. 1888. Again, you just need to know how the numbers are created. Milli is thousand, auto is eight, cento. That's going to be at the beginning of most of the records you see, unless it's Mille Novacento, 1900. So I don't have to teach you 1200. If you're looking at 1200s, okay, we have a, you're in the wrong class. You're in hyper advanced. Uh, that's okay. So what I'm going to do, since I didn't see the index at the beginning of the 1888 births, I'm going to scroll down, hopefully fast enough. I need to leave a little bit of time for what might be questions. I just want to see the, see, you need to see the process because this is not as nice as it could be. Okay, so here we have, I, I clicked on that because it's before that other black page and, um, and I could, I'm used to seeing the pattern on the page looks different than what it is on a regular record. Well, I'm looking for Stefano Popura. So I'm in Lombardo di Lisi. Hey, here's another little interesting tidbit. Sometimes the index puts D.I. Maria, D.I. Lisi, D.I. Niccolo in with Niccolo or Lisi. Uh, sometimes it doesn't. La Scola. So anything with a prefix like that, you might not find it under la, you might find it under scola. Another little tidbit. So I want the papuras. So the letter P. So these are in sequential order, the letter P. So I'm looking for papura. Now, again, you got to get used to the writer for that year. And uh, okay. Stefano Purpura di Francesco is number 113. I don't remember Stefano's dad, but I'm going to go with this because we're running out of minutes. <laughs> so we need record number 113. Now, how do I go to record 113? Well, you got to play higher, lower, the Bob Barker. Um, price is right way. I know he retired a long time ago and it was Drew Carey, but I still Bob Barker to me. And he's still alive. He's, I think he's 100 almost. So I'm backing up in the index. So it was 113. Write that down if you don't have a great memory and I don't. Okay. There's a bunch of stuff here that's all longhand and it's number 40. So these are additional little throw-in records. Don't worry about those yet, okay? So I'm going to try to back up real quick here. Now, I can do this. I can go here, and I can change the image number by a little bit, okay? I went by 10. Now, I skipped over that handwritten stuff. So now I go back. Now we have an actual record, and it's 856. And how many are on a page? We have three. Do you really want to go back to 113, one frame at a time? Of course you don't. So this is the point where you say, okay, you got to do a little bit of elementary math. If you're not good at math, then do it one page at a time or skip around. But what does it mean when there's three records on a page? It means that if I go back 100 images, I'm going back 300 numbers. Maybe a little, there's repeated pages, missing pages. So now I'm in the 500s. I still got to go to 113, don't I? So I'm going to go back another 300, and I'm at 254. Okay, so that's how you jump around. 
That's not in the handout. You might want to scribble that down or you, again, throw me an email and say, what were you doing when you were jumping around images? I'll be glad to explain it on, on an email because I need to write it down in, in uh, to make it easier on people. So I'm going to go to 457 because I don't want to go 300 back. It'll be too far back. Oh, look, we're at 109. We need 113. Now I'll go one at a time. So I'm at 112. And now I go to 113. I just have it zoomed in so you can see it. Yeah, I think this is him, actually. I forgot what month he was born in. So now I have a record. They put the last names first most of the time. And you notice, it, it uh, again, having, um, we were lucky it had his name with the parent in the index. That's very rare. So the, the quickest thing I got to teach everybody, because this is the thing I did totally wrong when I started, is that it said at the top, 1888, Adi Otto di Febrio, the 8th of February. So I recorded all these dates from the first date that it mentioned at the top of the record. Wrong. That's the date they went to the mayor to tell the mayor that a baby was born named Stefano Papora. So I went back to my grand aunt long time ago and I said, all those dates you gave me are wrong. Here's the record. It says he was born on February 8th. No, he was born on the 7th. I know that. But the record says the eight. Well, in the middle of the record, and this is explained in my handout, Del D, here it says Sete, seventh. Del Corrente Messe, the current month. That's when the baby was born. So please don't make that fundamental mistake that I made on my first several hundred records. Once in a while, the date will match up. It will be the same date when they went to the mayor. The bigger the town, sometimes it's a two or three day wait because the, the, the mother's recovering from the birth and the father's working. So somebody's got to go to the, you know, and, and report this birth. Okay. So real quick, we're looking for the parents. Okay. E comparso, Pupura Francesco. Again, it's in reverse order. At the age of Ventinove, that's 29. And he is a fisherman because Termini is on the water. So he's a fisherman, pescatore. Again, you kind of need to have a list of these nut words. And, you know, if you bring your computer to the library or you use it, translate it. Pescatore, Italian to English, fisherman. Okay. Um, so the dad is 29. In this case, the mother does have an age. Campagna Rosa, reverse order. Diani, age, years 23, 23. I'm not expecting you to learn translation this way. I'm just trying to give you the quickest method here to the, so, so we have the parents. And in my method that I showed you earlier, we would now find the marriage of Francesco Popura and Rosa Campagna. In Italian records, all women from birth to death are listed under their maiden name. All of them. If they got married nine times, and my grand aunt tried, she really did. Uh, she got she married and widowed three times, and she was on the hunt for number four, actually, when she finally died. But um, so in Italian records. They are by maiden name, 100%, even in the cemetery. Okay, I've talked a long time, and there's very little time for Q&A, but um, I hope you learned something that'll get you started if you haven't started, and I hope you were entertained if you have no Italian ancestry whatsoever. Thank you. Daniel, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. 
Uh, first of all, I want to thank you so much. This was so informative, but at the same time, confusing. No, no, no. You know what? I do a lot of Polish genealogy mm -hmm. and so much of the process, the formula is very similar, very, very similar. I kept shaking my head saying, yes, that's exactly how I do it. I, I was exactly I was glad to see you nodding. I'm like, okay, yeah. one of you gets it because I could see, well, I had to squirm down the Zoom and it was your yeah. face yeah. rather than mine, which is, you know, but I had to get it out of the way because it was blocking me from getting from page to page here. So, yeah. Sure. The, the one thing um, in my Polish versus your Italian records is that there's a lot of, um, of registrations and indexes that are like on a chart, not in a paragraph format. And it took me um, a while before I understood that uh, the baptismal date was first, and then the, bap the birth, birth date, date was second. Uh huh. Um, Those are baptism records. That's yes, what matters to them yes. is the date of baptism. And yeah. yeah. And the other thing that I found in my German when I was searching German, um, I uh, ran across uh, how old the people were. Um, you know, the years and the months and the dates or hours um, if they were little babies. Um, I remember probably two years ago. Uh, right in the middle of COVID, I was doing some searching and I ran into cholera in Germany. And I just found like whole communities that, you know, like families on this one day, they like were just crunching them all in there. It, yeah, was, yeah. it was very, very sad, but so much. And you're absolutely right about um, uh bringing your it, becoming very familiar with the language even if you can't speak it to be able to read it and um i remember when i first started uh german i i thought okay i've got my german to english english to german book i'm going to take one of these words and i'm going to figure it out and i sat there and i struggled because it was in script it wasn't script, in yeah. typed. oh my god and then the word ended up being the. <laughs> I was devastated. The. Oh, but well, I took I took German in high school, and A, I have no German ancestry to read records for, and B, I work for a German company, but I only took two years in high school. So I can say, you know, Guten Morgen. Yeah. And we have, you know, we have a couple of people working in our building who are actually from Germany, and that's the big trans, you know, yeah. that's it. I'm done yes. with, my, I've used up my language. I want to say two real quick things. Okay. You mentioned babies. Mm -hmm. um, the Italians are very, very uh, consistent about renaming children name, or naming new children if the previous child of that gender has died. Yeah. So to those of you who are going to do this research and you have no idea where your great, when your great grandpa was born, and you find him. Oh, here he is, 1885, Stefano mm -hmm. Papora. That doesn't guarantee it's the right one. Right. Guarantees it's the right one when you have something that matches another document. Mm -hmm. Because there might be, I got one family that had five Palmo Abenantes and four Rosa Abenantes. Yes. Okay. And it's a, the tragedy of that. And families don't talk about it either. Mm -hmm. Um, even though it happened a long, long time ago. I mean, I, when I went to Italy, I met with a, a, a cousin of my grand aunt and, uh, and he, he's a college professor and was mayor of the town. So he knew everything. And so he said that there were four children and he named off the four children. And I said, and non quattro figli, nove figli. And he went, oh, no, 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 quattro. I said, nove. And I actually showed him the documents which ironically he was in charge of while he was mayor. So he never <laughs> looked it up. So there were five infants that died, including a set of twins. Oh. And he went crazy, not angry, crazy. I thought he might be angry. crazy. He seemed like a nice guy, but I'm like, I'm showing this old man up. This isn't good. And he didn't speak a word of English and I didn't speak a word of Italian, but I showed him the records and I showed him the twins and he went, ah, 
because there were twins in his family and nobody could figure out where they came from. Oh. I said, yeah. there, there they are. They didn't yeah. live, but they, they're the, there's your twins. Yeah. Uh, he, and, and at that point, he listened to me. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was a beautiful moment. I, and mm -hmm. He's gone now, but it's... Uh, it, he, he, but anyway, yeah, again, the babies are going to be... Uh, uh, can be renamed. Uh, that's the only place where it's really good. If you really don't know a date, a birth date of someone, you might need to go try to find all the births of that family. Yeah. That's very, very difficult. That means going through 20 years, maybe 25 years of births from the time of the marriage of the parents to sure. get everybody covered. And okay, you get to Stefano and now you get three more brothers and they're named other things. Okay, this is probably the right one because yeah. they didn't rename the the future ones. Yeah, yeah. What what an interesting interesting program. I mean, this was packed. This was packed, and and like you said, this could be part one. You know. Um, yeah. No. Well, for for the Italian Cultural Center, this is part one and a half. I, okay. You know, because it, it's it helped again. Thank goodness you told me that a lot of the people that uh, want to attend these things are already part of a group yes. yeah. at the library. Very yeah. few libraries have a genealogy specialist. Uh, they've got someone appointed to that post. That doesn't mean they know much about genealogy half the time. Yeah. Uh, and others are incredibly good. Yeah. And they really go, th and then they, then they put groups together. Um, Schomburg, uh, he's retired yeah. now, but uh, my, um, uh, Anthony Kierna, you know, did a mm -hmm. fantastic job in Arlington Heights. I know the North ones, of course. Yeah. But uh, um, so that's it. That was good because I could have really said, well, this is how you, you know, this is how you turn a computer on. Well, oh, yes. Yes. You know, I was I was very happy that you chose Family Search versus um, a specific Italian website, because I I have been saying for 25 years, at least, that Family Search is my favorite website, not only because it's free, but because of all of the um, documents that you can have access. I, I am a firm believer. I do not believe I should have to pay for my family history. Um, although I do, I, I do when I- I, I believe, I believe, I firmly believe that if the county wants to sell a copy of a birth record for $17 plus the vital check fee, I should get a piece of that. Yes, yes. Because yeah. if it weren't for my grandfather, who's now dead, right? Uh, uh, you know, okay, we'll give it to my parents. They're still mm -hmm. around. They mm -hmm. get the they get fifty percent. Because if it weren't for the birth of that That's human right. being, yeah. they wouldn't have been able to charge for that record. You're right. I know it's a joke. Yeah. It's because of how expensive things are in in um, Chicago, and mm -hmm. a lot of the other counties aren't much better. Lake right. County by me is sweet four dollars for a genealogy copy of a record and if they don't find it they will give you the four dollars back wow wow mm -hmm. i yeah. i've been I, I play around with family search all the time and it just amazes me maybe two years ago i thought i wonder what this images stuff is oh you're yeah, hooked. i never got to it yeah you're hooked you, mm -hmm. you're, you're absolutely hooked when you go into images and you have you you're right you have to use their link because I was looking for a, a particular place in Poland and just to see what comes up the the records are unbelievable at least yeah, well they just threw I mean there's stuff in here that I'm not sure why it's here and they don't even have a title so we don't even know it's just right 970 images from 1901 yeah. Trajano Bari. What is that? I guess yeah. you just got to look. Yes. Uh, but I, you know, I and you have 142 results. So you have 142 files that could take that could hold 970 images. Oh, fun. Well, it could be. Yeah, it could be even more. But I, like yes. I say, for whatever reason, I don't know why these are. The only good thing about images, frankly, the, the great thing about it is that you can look at that at home. Yes. Yes. These are absolutely. these are home. These there's no restrictions on this because right. they just haven't done anything to right. uh, categorize it yet. Yes. And uh, yeah, I found a ton of stuff this way. Um, that again, that when the stuff was not listed, see here, 1936 deaths 
for Trigiano Morti. Okay. Yeah. Now this is in the catalog now under that tribunale, but before it wasn't. Mm -hmm. So I would just hit this. And again, I'm at home. So I just yeah. went record one. Mm -hmm. I put it in family tree because I've got every, my, the town of Trigiano, I have everybody. There's infants that I just haven't done yet. Mm -hmm. but they're genealogically less significant than the adults. I have every marriage from my town from 1701 to 1945 in my file. And there's a very small handful of couples that just don't belong there. They were passing through and they never lived there. We don't know why they got married, but they did. <laughs> um, and uh, well, you know, maybe nine months later, we know why they got married, but at yeah. any rate, yeah. Um, but yeah, this stuff, yeah, this is, a, it's a different Zoom. It's a different image thing, but um, mm -hmm. yeah, but this is, yeah, I was going to jump in here and if I couldn't find anything in the um, Popora and the uh, Termini Amorese or whatever, but um, you know, the record format is incredibly yeah. similar yes. to the, from 1875 all the way to 1945 is practically the same. And again, same deal here. They have a death date, which is the date they went to the mayor to say this yeah. person died. Yeah. And then down here, the OG, they, the death records are almost always within a day. Yeah. So they say Ieri for yesterday and OG for today. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. But without that, you got the wrong death dates. Yeah. Yeah. The marriages. For the longest time, there's only one date on those. And then in the 30s and 40s, 1930s and 40s, now they, they have a date at the top and a date in the middle that says, I don't even want to get into the fact that the pre-1865 records may list the baptism or the church marriage along with the civil record. Wow. Yeah, that's advanced. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> because now, now we get, I call it, I call it genealogical theology. <laughs> What date do I put when I have a church marriage date and a civil marriage date on the same piece of paper? Which one do I put as my preferred date in my family tree? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where is St. Thomas Aquinas to answer that question? Mm -hmm. and maybe there is one, but I don't know. Is, is it Thomas W. Jones? Is it Elizabeth Schoen Mills? Who is it? Mm -hmm. You know, Maureen Brady? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, wow. you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, there, there's, little you know when you put in an italian uh, uh region do you put in the region as spelled in america or a region as spelled in italy do you put italy or the word italia oh. this, this is i call it theology because without that answer everything else falls apart you know yeah, yeah. Well, um, I want to thank you again, and uh, and Cindy and Marie are big big members of our genealogy club. Uh, Kath, Kathy O'Leary, who who has joined us, she's the genealogy guru uh, at the Oak Lawn Public Library and the president of the uh, Tinley Moraine Genealogical Genealogist Society um, as well. Um, and before I even worked at Oak Lawn Library. Uh, and I was still at Governor State, I would go to the Oakland Library on Sundays and Kathy would help me. And then when I became an employee at Oakland, I went up to her and I said, oh, I know you, you helped me with my genealogy. And she didn't know who I was <laughs> because she helped so many people. I, you know? Yeah, I've, and, I've run into that. I, I'm, I'm terrible, for a genealogist, I'm terrible at names. Well, me too, but you know, it doesn't matter if I, if I find something for myself or I find it for someone else, I get such a kick out of it because I'm helping someone make a connection. I'll tell you, I, I've been at this so long that it's been a long time since I've had a real breakthrough, a yeah. major, okay. Those yeah. days are gone. Yeah. I'm cleaning up loose ends. It's going to take the rest of my life to do it. Yeah. And that's so, yeah. So when somebody else comes into the Buffalo Grove, Family History Center. I'm a volunteer there forever. And somebody came in who said, I, she, she asked her husband about his ancestry and he says, I don't want to talk about it. Mm. That was his answer. Now she mm -hmm. was a church, Mormon church member. So uh -huh. she wants to tie everybody together for their sacrament, you know? Yeah. And uh, she, uh, so she's, she mentioned something 
and she said, oh yeah, my husband's uh, parents were Anthony Geekus and so-and-so. And I just did a search and I found somebody who died who was married to an Anthony Geekus in Chicago. I said, did you, do you have any connections with Chicago? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and before we, we were supposed to be open till one. We, were, we stayed open till four. Oh, geez. I wasn't even supposed to work that day. I was just oh. there. Yeah. And, and she left with five generations of Americans. Um, wow. And, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, when I'm at work and people cry, it's a bad thing. When I'm at the Family History Center and people cry, it's yeah. an amazing thing. Yeah. It's a genealogy then I go home dance. And, you know, well, yes. I, I did that. And yeah. I, I, I told her at the end, I said, if he doesn't say, if he says he doesn't want to talk about it, don't tell him what you found today. Okay. Keep it to yourself. Yeah. He's obviously not interested or he's got some problem with it. Let it go. Yeah. Just say, you know, just stop asking him. And at some point he's going to say, you never asked me about my ancestry. I don't need it. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dan, <laughs> there, there thank are people you. like that. Yeah, yeah, it looks like we've cleared the room. We it it does look <laughs> we didn't like do this. one question. I feel bad about that, but well, it, we're seven forty five. We were worried about seven forty. Oh, we're not going to go to seven forty five. Yeah, we are. <laughs> it was it was fascinating. I, I mean, like I said, so much of what you presented, I use in my Polish, and I've only been really searching my Polish uh, aggressively for like eighteen months. Uh, prior to that, I was just fiddling with it for like five years or so, because um, I was really working on other branches that I was far more familiar with. So, so much of this I could relate to, and I just certainly really appreciate um, all the time and effort that you took to create this program. And many, and, and Cindy and um, Marie and other people said, thank you very much. A great program. Thank you.